feel it over here? In the middle! Right here! Rest on your last night! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, breadwinners, thread spinners, and all those in between, you're now watching the TNF podcast with your favorite bipolar rock and roller, Mr. J. Curtis Strickland. Just want to uh, announce some of the upcoming shows we've got on the 7th of April. That's going to be Sunday. Uh, Hoya from Madball, Scarhead, Smoking Word TV, and Smoke AD. And it's going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, Joe Mustin and Johnny Smurdell. From Advent and Beloved, that's going to be on the 14th, on uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. Uh, Scott Vogel from Terror, Buried Alive, Despair, Slugfest, that's going to be on the 21st at uh, 5 p.m. That's a Sunday. And a whole bunch more awesome shows coming up. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is a, a very funny comedian that's been working the L.A. circuit for quite some time. Um, he's... Uh, can you can you hear me? <laughs> it was oh, I hear you fine. Head. Sorry. Oh, okay. yeah. No, I I just like to smack myself on the side of the head every now and again, just to just to remind myself that the dream is really happening. This is real. That's right, man. Alex Elkin, how you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing all right, man. I'm uh, really good. Uh, really good. I'm home, which is nice. That's kind of a vacation for me, and I'm just uh, glad to be here on the show. Were you Were you just out on the road? Always, man. I don't know if you follow the Careers on Fire tour. But uh, it is uh, it's a constant it's a constant uh, road battle, man. Uh, this weekend, I'm going to be in Manteca, California at the Deaf Puppy Comedy Club. It's a brand new club that just opened up and I'm really excited to be uh, kicking it off with them. And uh, and then it's a it's it's a drive back home. And then I hit the road again. I'm jumping on a cruise ship. I'm going to uh, who knows. And it's it's going to be a lot of fun. So. Yeah, Bando said that always. you uh, that you're working the cruise ships as well. That must be that must have uh, some mm -hmm. interesting stories that come with that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, crazy stuff. Plus, I work. You know, I don't work for the good ones. I work for Carnival. Uh, oh. But <laughs> no, but that's where the crazy stories come from, man. It's just nothing but a trailer park on the water, man. It's 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 a uh, it's just a floating Walmart, and I love it. Uh, they're my people. These are my folks. So we have a that's we awesome. have a really good time. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, delve into your history a little bit. So um, did you come from like a performance background prior to comedy? Did you kind of grow up doing, uh, you know, like acting or anything like that? How did you get bit by the comedy bug? Huh. You know, when I was really, really young, we're talking like four years old, I went to Jewish church with my great grandmother in Palm Springs. I don't know if you know, it's Friday night services, they call it. And it's customary for the firstborn male Jew to drink the uh, sacramental wine. And I did that. And uh, it, I, I played it up. I hammed it up. I didn't like it. I made faces. I did. You know, I spoke Hebrew. Anyway, everybody really liked it. The congregation was laughing. Even the rabbi was laughing. And the only reason I bring that up is even at that age, I didn't know what it was. But that feeling I got from the audience laughing and that rush that I felt from being accepted and going like, hey, that kid's got it or whatever it is. I don't know. I loved it. I wanted it. I wanted it to keep coming and I didn't know what it was. But from then on, honestly, man, it's just I was always the class clown. I was always the one yucking it up, you know, getting the class to laugh. The problem was, is I didn't even realize it some of the time I was, you know, uh, I'd say something and the class would laugh and then I'd get in trouble and be like, oh. Uh, oh, oh, I see it now. I know I didn't realize it, you know, but it, it sounded funny. And I came to this realization and it's not stroking my ego or anything, but I just, I just kind of think funny. I just think funny. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. Sometimes it gets laughs. Sometimes it sounds stupid. Uh, but I think funny and I just didn't know what else to do with it other than stand up. So 
when when I learned that it was a job that you could do, uh, you know, I'd sit around and I'd, I'd listen to like old Smothers Brothers records. I still got them here. Uh, you know, Cosby, oh, God forbid, and uh, uh, Steve Martin, you know, all the uh, Carlin and Pryor and, and all those guys. And I'd sit around pissing my pants laughing about them. And I didn't realize that, okay, they're just standing up in front of an audience talking. And um, finally, uh, when I saw Louis Anderson on TV doing stand up comedy years later, I realized, oh, well, fat kids can do this too. And I thought, you know what? I want to try it. So when I was 14 years old, I wrote an act. This was crazy. I popped up in the middle of the night and I saw myself on stage doing this act. And I just, I picked out what I could remember from the dream because it was killing. And I wrote it down on my little compact computer, compact presario. You know, this is 1994. And, uh, and I was 93 actually. And so uh, I wrote out this little act and I did a stand up routine for the high school talent show, Sandy Miss High School Football Rules. Uh, and uh, I ended up winning the damn thing. And it gave me this, first of all, it just gave me the, the confidence that, um, that I could do it. Two, it gave me the thrill that I'd been looking for my whole life since I was a, a little kid. And it encouraged it, which made me think, oh, maybe I could do this for a living. So that was a long way of putting it, but uh, that's what happened. That's where I came from awesome man and and so uh you know with that did you pursue any sort of like you know going to like a second city or like uh you know ucb or something like that uh some sort of i guess professional comedy score did you just kind of get out there and just start going to open mics and yeah no i didn't uh i didn't chase any professional route i i pretty much kept it in high school while I was in high school, um, <clears throat> when I was about 16 or 17, I'd have my buddies that could drive, uh, help me branch out. And I'd go out to like, you know, the comedy store in LA or the laugh factory or the improv. And I'd do their little potlucks in the Sunday nights. And because I was under 18 or 21, I'd, they'd have to rush me in through the kitchen and I'd go and do my three minutes and they'd rush me back out. And, uh, I did all that. And, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was tough, but it was, it was a way to build an act. Uh, at the time or so I thought um, but no I didn't I didn't really do anything professionally uh, until I, I mean until I went out to those professional clubs but what do you you know what do you say about stand-up it's not like we go to, to college you know and get a degree in jokeology you know I, I got an MBA and uh, in, uh, punchlines you know so you really it's like boxing man you jump in the ring you you know you, you start getting hit you start hitting people I bombed for you know 10 15 20 years I still bomb uh, but I got better and better and eventually you get paid for it. And so that's, that's kind of what happens. And it, comedy is weird because as long as you stick with it, you can't fail. You know, the only way to fail at comedy is to stop doing it. You know, you eventually yeah. you'll find a monicum of success. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Um, and so, um, you know, so you went out there and you started hitting the scene and whatnot and, you know, I, I think it's pretty interesting that you do the the cruise ship circuit because I, I I can only like I was saying at the top of the show I can only imagine that that comes with like a, a slew of really interesting uh, you know intricate type stories. Um, so uh, when you went out and started performing, you, did you notice like you know you said you got some good response, but what what would be an instance when you know you feel like you probably didn't either read the room correctly or like. You know, somebody got, you know, real pissed off or, or, you know, even a heckler. What, like, what's the situation? You hey, had all with? that happened in one night. <laughs> I was, uh, I was early on. I was starting out. I was still doing open mics. And when you're doing open mics, uh, at least back when I was doing open mics, uh, I did open mics back in the 1900s. <laughs> We'd hitch up the oxen and go down to the comedy shack and do jokes by candlelight. No, we, we, we had, it was old school, you know, and we yeah. used to do comedy when there, when it was a time when you could actually, you know, try stuff out and you didn't have to be afraid of getting canceled or, you know, if the joke didn't work, it fell flat. Or in my case, uh, they got really mad. So I was at this open mic. I don't even remember. It was somewhere down in the gritty parts of like, you know, El Monte, California, or, you know, some high end city like that. It was, you know, a pretty big deal. And it was this pizza place that had an outdoor, you know, patio area and they were doing comedy that night. 
And I went up and I was bombing. Nobody was laughing. Nobody was paying attention. And so I started making fun of the audience. And there was this Australian guy that had been drinking since the sun came up, apparently. And he was not happy with my set. You know, Oi, what do you think you're doing? You can't come out here, man. No employment. You know, I can't, I can't do the accent, but it was god awful. You know, really kind of, it's an emergency. Crikey, look it. And he's drinking and he's pissed and he doesn't like my stuff. Well, it turns out the people I was making fun of and the whole group that wasn't laughing was a deaf group that was gathering there for pizza that night. Uh -huh. I'm sitting there making fun of them. Like, hey, do you guys speak English? What's your man like you? guys don't like comedy? What's wrong with you? Is your thing? <laughs> and I didn't realize they're, you know, they're deaf. And this no. guy knew. And he got upset. And he wanted to fight me. Like, he wanted to all out just brawl over jokes. And, you know, thankfully, I had a buddy with me who, who had my back. And he kind of, you know, backed me up while we got in the truck and headed out. You know, I'm not fighting some, I'm not fighting the crocodile hunter on 16 Fosters, you know, and, and, an, and an El Monte gig that probably paid drink tickets and, you know, exposure. Exposure to what? Deaf people? This was the worst. Anyway, that that's just one experience of somebody just getting really mad and they take, they get all in their feelings and they think they're going to just come up, hey, you, know, hey, you can't say that, Hagrid, or whatever they want to call me, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. Um and what did you find out like mid joke while you were telling the joke or was it like, you know, you, you got off the stage and like, Hey, that's the reason this guy's so pissed off about you is because, Hey, these people over here are, are deaf. Well, he was screaming it. Yeah. He, oh, when he started, when he finally, stage. yeah. When he was finally coherent and you know, when I was finally understanding what he, cause he was like, Oh, you can't sort it, you know, Oi, you know, and I don't know if we could swear on here, but he's using F bombs and, you know, telling me what I can do with myself. And, uh, you know, calling me a maternal fornicator, all that kind of stuff. So I was just, you know, I'm like, I'm figuring this guy's just drunk and mad. But it turns out, you know, he's like, you know, oh, you, these people are deaf. They can't understand a word you're saying. You're on it. Oh, I'm going to knock you. You know, he's, he's going to tight you to the junkyard. That's what I remember him saying. I'm going to tight you to the junkyard. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> like, okay, well, we're going to the junkyard. Like, we're already in El Monte. You know, how much junkier, yardier can we get? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, man. Now, you, you, there's you there's tons to have, of those. There's tons of those stories. Horrible people. Horrible people. You, you seem to have a real gift for, like, the accents and, and the voices. Is that something you've ever done, like, cartoons? No, yeah. Uh, hey, this I'm, a, I'm a plushie. I, uh, this is Derek. Uh, Derek is a, uh, he's a cartoon character on the Tuttle Twins. I don't know if that's picking up Tuttle Twins cartoon show. Anyway, it's on the Angel Studios app. Uh, anyway, I played Derek and several other cartoon characters on the show. Actually, my kids are on the show too. They're actually playing characters themselves. So, oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it's a family affair. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it's, it's just hours of watching television and a misspent youth, man. I just sitting there mimicking all the the Warner Brothers, the Disney, the you know everything Mel Blanc did, June Foray, uh, Thor Thorough Ravenscroft, uh, you know all these great voice actors of my generation. I've only named you know the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's mimicking them. If you were growing up as a kid in the '80s. You would always see Frank Welker's name on everything. Oh, Frank Welk, yeah. And then I find out my uncle-in-law plays golf with the guy. I can't oh, even get an autograph. I know, and that incredible. <laughs> but yeah, Frank Welker, my God, he's the voice. He's literally the voice of a generation. Yeah, man. You know? All yeah. he did a bunch so, of the Transformers and, stuff. Did Ghostbusters? Oh. Yeah, a bunch. And if you don't, and if you don't know, he's Freddy from Scooby Doo, and has been since the beginning. So uh, we're talking That's what right. 1969, you know? Yeah. And now, yeah, yeah, yeah. now, I mean, Scooby Doo has gone through several different iterations. We, you know, but now he's uh, now he's Scooby Doo as well. Uh, oh, Paul wow. Winchell. You know, a guy that played you know uh, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger, and he was you know all these. Uh, he he did uh, he did some Transformer stuff as well. I mean, just all these great names, just following them, mimicking them, doing their voices, trying to mimic what they're trying to say and do the accents as well. And it would just make my friends giggle, and that was what I was all about Good, growing man. up. And then I turned it into 
a job. And I got to tell you, for somebody who doesn't have a job, I stay pretty damn busy with it. I mean, that's that's the dream, man. Uh, you know, you mentioned that was with uh, Angel Studios. That's the one that did like the uh, the Sound of Freedom and. Yeah, they do dry bar comedy. They do The Chosen, if you're familiar with that. They've also got a really cool couple of cartoons out now, David, which is, of course, the story of King David, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, Wing Feather, which if you're into fantasy Dungeons and Dragons type of stuff, that's a really cool series to watch as well. And it's it's something you can put the kids in front of, go make dinner, and not worry about them coming to you asking, how come this man was breastfeeding a baby? You know, you don't you don't have that kind of stuff. It's just nice. You know, you, you can just, yeah, it's wholesome. <laughs> right yeah it, it that when i heard about them doing that and like kind of trying to take like a different approach to entertainment i was like you know that's kind of much needed considering like is, a lot of the the trash that comes out you know well isn't that crazy that today to be rebellious is to say no we're not going to show you a bunch of sex and the f word and we're not going to have guys dress up and drag and read kids uh stories we're going to have, you know, traditional values. The show that I'm on, the Tuttle Twins, it teaches kids all kinds of crap that you don't want them to learn. I mean, God, their First Amendment rights, capitalism, uh, the, you know, they're, they're, uh, how uh, how communism has affected the world. Uh, they teach kids about Bitcoin. I mean, it's it's crazy. You don't want them learning that stuff. You want to make sure they come out of school knowing that, you know, magma is the center of the earth and there's 75 genders. <laughs> Those seem like pretty... Uh unpopular views to hold in the comedy circuit though don't no i mean or depending on where you're at that could go one of two ways right yeah uh i can be i can be pretty not well received you know if you put my face on a poster anywhere in salem oregon north uh you're gonna get some phone calls so yeah uh i i think in in my line of work it's very popular to uh echo chamber this kind of mentality you know and repeat these things that uh that I guess we're now discovering to be truths. Uh, me personally, I'm like I said, I come from a different time. You know, yeah. we don't in my house when I read kids to, uh, stories. You know, for bedtime, we don't start with "Once upon a time." We have to start with "Back when only women gave birth." So uh, these views that I hold, uh, yeah, no, not exactly popular, I guess, in the in the comedy and uh, entertainment community. But but in spite of all that, thank God. Uh, we've been able to plow through a career and uh, make a decent living and have a good time doing it. So I don't regret a thing, man. You know, you can make your phone calls, you can chalk up the buildings and you can cross out my posters and tell me that I'm not, uh, I'm canceled, but it doesn't really work. Facebook's not a real place. So I, uh, I'm just, I'm just happy to, to be anywhere I'm at and I'm working and I'm living the dream and I'm doing what I love. Yeah. But it's controversial, man. I've had some, I've had some nasty, hateful things said to me. Oh, geez. Yeah, and I mean, like, I commend you for being able to, you know, kind of stand your ground in that regard. And like, you know, I, I think, like you're saying, when, when certain truths are kind of, you know, learned, it, it's one of those things where it's like when you when you see it, you can't unsee it type thing, you know. And so, you know, for people to be able to go and uh, go against a, a narrative in like uh, the entertainment world, I mean, that that's takes tremendous strength i think you know like but a that lot of people but like, that's the that's the comedian's job that's the musician's job that's the poet's job it's you know th that's what the minstrel does man if he's got any mm -hmm. balls about him he takes a mirror holds it up to society and goes hey look at this stupid stuff we're doing can you we were putting three masks on okay if you if you think two masks are safer than one your dad should have worn four condoms you know i mean we we have to at some point we have to pull the brakes because we, we i don't know what happened in america but uh you know back when i was a kid we had this crap floating around that anybody could use it it was just in the atmosphere that we were pulling it down and just using it freely we called it common sense and then apparently after 2000 or something uh, the Backstreet Boys hit the scene and everybody just went, you know, oh, let's set sail for the retard islands. And that's what we did. And everybody was just like, I want it that way. But the job of the comedian, the job of the poet, the job of the minstrel, the, the, the musician is to show society its foibles at least in in a way that's entertaining because uh, what did, uh, I don't know if he was the one that said it, Oscar Wilde, who said, 
if you're going to, I'm paraphrasing, but if you're going to tell somebody that, if you're going to tell them the truth, make sure that you make them laugh. Otherwise they'll kill you. And that, that's very true. Nobody likes to hear the truth. Nobody wants to hear that they're fat and ugly. But guess what? You know, just because you didn't get asked to prom doesn't mean you're a boy. You know what I mean? So it, 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 there's all kinds of, of, of different ways of handling it. And uh, the comedian's job, at least from my perspective, is to make you laugh about it, but make you laugh about it in a truthful way. You know, I don't have anything against... Um, you know, the, the, the trans community, right? If you're going to snip your giblets off, the thing is I get to giggle about it for a little bit, but after that we're cool and I'll buy a, a Bud Light or whatever you're drinking. And, <laughs> and we can, we can commune as one. We can be all right. Sure. But the thing is where I draw the line is when you start challenging, you know, uh, what we know, the self-evident truths, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, self-evident truth is that man and woman are made for one another and that, you know, they procreate and they procreate throughout the earth. And that's, that's the truth, you know? And when you start telling my kids that that's not the truth, that's where I draw the line. Don't, don't tell my kids that, you know, if you're sitting at my table and Jacob wants to be called Jenny, then you'll be Jenny at my table. But once you start telling my kids that, you know, you can, <laughs> you, you can breastfeed or, you know, whatever, that's where I'm like, oh, okay, all right, game over. That's, uh, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're not playing anymore, um, you know? And so uh, that's what the, that's what the comic does. Kevin Upshaw says, hey, Alex, it's your buddy, Kevin Upshaw. Never heard of him. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Kevin Upshaw. You okay. got to check him out. He's he's actually a fantastic musician, and he's another one. He's out there. He's grinding. He's working the road. Uh, he's building a following, and uh, he's he's actually very popular, in spite of the fact that he doesn't hold those kind of views that you would expect an entertainer that's gaining a following to hold. But again, it comes down to the fact that we're in this rebellious generation where kids are growing up and they're like, no, I'm going to cut my hair short and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to wait till I get married to have sex. What do you think about that, mom and dad? And you have these parents out here like, what are you talking about? You need to go to Hogwarts and, and put in a nose ring. And what is, what is this? Only one color for your hair? Oh, what are we going to do? You know, it's a weird, different rebellion. Elvis is dead. It was like, uh, now what's his name on, um, uh michael j fox on family ties yeah he they was all like want to the, be Alex the conservative like suit wearing guy, and his parents were like hippie liberals <laughs> right. yeah the hippie yeah the, the, these they, they want him to wear these you know uh hippie tie-dye shirts and this guy's like i want to do a double windsor you know what i mean that's that's uh, that's where we're at that's where we're at <laughs> yeah man yeah man and and you know you mentioned music are, are you a musician as well do you play music yeah, I like to play. I play a few instruments, and uh, uh, I've uh, I've created music, and I've jammed in a few bands, and uh, I love that. I love that part. I like hanging uh, hanging with musicians. Any uh, anything like what what kind of genres you play in? You know, it kind of depends on the instrument that I'm playing. If I'm if I'm uh, if I'm on the bass, I want to play a lot of rock and roll and maybe some you know some blues. Uh, if I'm uh, the piano, it's going to be ballads, guitar. It's going to be you know rock and roll, maybe even some jazz, and then saxophone. Of course, it's going to be lead stuff and jazz and things like that. So uh, I like to be all over the place. I like to kind of play anything. Uh, I really dig classic rock. So I was in a band called The Hideaways, and we did 60s and 70s cover tunes. And that was a lot of fun. I like to sing and play sax and play bass for that band. And and uh, we did some fun stuff. Uh, David King. Yo, David says, King! I met you on Carnival Panorama. Love your act and your conservatism. Thank you, bro. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, The Panorama, that was a long time ago. Thanks for remembering, man. You know what's amazing about my Carnival people? I make fun of them because I'm one of them. But... Uh, they're great loyal people man they show up to gigs they'll they'll plan it out they'll get a hotel room we drove 300 miles because we saw you on the show but we want to see you here they're wonderful i love these people so there's this stigma about carnival or not excuse me not carnival but about cruise comedians you know what i mean it's like the stigma yeah. of like the band nerd you remember that you know like you know oh you're in a band you're in band in school what a nerd no man that's gone look the comics that sit here and crap on cruise comics are number one, I guarantee you, not working comics. And I was number say, two, probably not working. Yeah. They're not working comics. And number two, they're just jealous, man. Look, we are doing what we love to do every single night of the week out there, going to exotic places, being paid for it. And we have a 30 minute shift. I can't think of a much better gig other than being able to go home every night. I can't think of a much better gig 
to be able to do what I love than that. So uh, it, it, it's, it's not uncool. It's, it's, it's really cool. And for those of them that think it's uncool, keep thinking that because you know what? We don't need you. Stay out. It's a, it's a really, really great fun gig. And uh, I, it's going to be really disappointing the day I get fired from it. Uh, let's see. David King says, sorry, it was sunshine. Oh, the sunshine. Oh, okay. Well, that wasn't that long ago. But it still means something, David. Right here. Oh, no. Let's see. Uh, John M. says, loved your show on the Elation Come and found you on here due to your show. Right on. This is, this is what I'm talking about, man. My carnival people, they, they come out in droves. They they really support, and uh, they're, they're good folks, man. Every single one of them. How did you them. land that gig? Was that something that was like, you know... <laughs> friend or you know they asked yeah it was or... okay yes i did get referred i got referred by a comedian so in 2016 i was lucky enough to win the biggest badasserist comedy competition ever in the history of the world the san francisco comedy competition i only say that because it is i saw the video no comedy well there's no comedy competition that's gone on longer there's no comedy competition that has has more prestigious uh, uh, comedians come out of it, save maybe the Seattle comedy competition, which is only a few years younger. But um, I won San Francisco in 2016. And we're talking big names that came out of that. You know, Robin Williams placed second on the first year it did it. Uh, you had Ellen wow. DeGeneres, Patton Oswald, Sinbad, uh, Marsha Warfield, big name comedians that have come out of that. And then, well, me. But uh, I won it. And, you know, in the regular civilian world, that probably doesn't mean anything, but in the comedy world, it, it holds a little water. And so I think people started opening up my emails a little bit more after that happened. And so I accredited to that. And when I was in the competition, I was working with Heath Harmison, who's a really, really funny comic uh, and a, just an overall great guy, family dude. And he hooked me up with his agent and they liked me. They went through my background check. I was lucky enough to get uh, sucked in. And I jumped in in December of 2019. <laughs> so I was there for about three months before everything went to hell. And uh, I came back about a year and a half later. Um, and, you know, things had changed and it's it's still fun, but uh, it's not what it was. You know. Yeah, surely not. And, and so, you, you know, that that sounds like. Yeah, every comic's dream is to be able to, you know, go and work regularly. I, I can't imagine why anyone would would slag on that, you know. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. It's it's like uh, you're a musician, yeah. Uh, I play music as well, yeah. yeah. So okay, so all right, so imagine, so the way they see it is, either you, it, it's like you're you're the cover band that never made it, or you're 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 the. Uh, the washed up band that's now, you know, doing the casinos, you know, you know what I mean? That's the way comics look at it. Like sure. couldn't make it in the early scene. You could, oh, you couldn't be a Dave Chappelle. So you're just going to go out and do stand up on cruise ship. Well, first of all, a hold, you know how many, I mean, you can count on two hands, how many really famous Dave Chappelle comedians that make it to that level. You know what I mean? The rest of us, what they don't know about, the rest of us are out there doing those crappy little one-nighters out in Podunk, you know, Mississippi and, and you know, BFE. And we're, we're grinding every night. We're doing that Wednesday night gig and our check ends in a nine or a one. And we have to leave the stage early the night before so we can get to the next gig on time because it's so far away, you know. And there's the corporate comics and the people that are out there grinding and working every day that you don't see on TV and Netflix and, you know, the, the comedy shows or at the store because they're out there on the road. And I'm one of those. And, you know, it's not an excuse because I worked with uh, Ralphie May. I worked with Carlos Mencia. I worked with Fluffy. And I'm not dropping names, but the, the reason I mention them is because I've seen their lives, man. And it's hectic. And fame, that scares the hell out of me. Fame scares the hell out of me. And... If I can live my life doing what I love, pay my bills, put the cleats on my kids' feet and still go to the meets, uh, I've I've accomplished the dream. That's the goal. I thought I wanted that when I started. When I started at 14, man, I wanted to be Jack Black. I wanted to be in all the movies. And I was, yeah, it's going to be in your face, man. Yeah, I'm going to be the actor. And you, you're going to see me in films and TV. I'm going to be everywhere. And then when I saw what that life entailed and not being able to go anywhere without the public criticism and now with the internet where everybody can sit in their underwear and tell you what a horrible person you are by typing it out, man, yeah. that's frightening to me. And I don't want my kids exposed to that. So 
I'm happy with what I'm doing. And it's, it, it's not because I couldn't chase the LA clubs and chase that big dream and, and go out there and do that. It's not what I wanted. And some comics do want that and good for you and chase it. But uh, for me and my family, man, uh, we're going to do what we love. John M uh, says, I was the one who said you uh, sounded like Sam K. That, that doesn't narrow it down. That's like the guy that said, I, I looked like a uh, meatloaf or, uh, or, or fat Aquaman <laughs> or, or Jack Black or fat Jesus uh, or Chumley from Pawn Stars. <laughs> Kevin says, how is Cleekley doing? You know what, Kevin? Cleekley's doing great. As a matter of fact, she got hired onto the Tuttle Twins and she's doing a, uh, a character now. She's a, uh, she's, she's a alien mermaid fish from another planet who sees visions uncontrollably. And her name is Sep. And uh, she's got a contract and everything. She's up through the next few seasons with me. I'm excited. My son, uh, my 16-year-old, he just got uh, hired to voice Helmut uh, Hubner, who was actually a Hitler youth who was um, secretly writing pamphlets against the Nazis and was murdered for his trouble back when he was 17 years old, back in 1944, 1945. Oh, and he, wow. they're doing, they're bringing him into the one of the episodes. And my son is doing his German accent, yeah, and he's going to play this character, and it's going to be oh. him as this, as this real person. <laughs> That's cool. That is sweet, man. Um, you know, and, and I, I think it's interesting because a, a lot of people will know uh, Angel Studios from The Sound of Freedom. And, you yeah. know, the, I think I recall a story about how it sat on the shelf for like five years or something crazy like that for a long from time. From what I understand, I just didn't want to release the film. Uh, well, yeah, well, they, when you say they, it was Disney, Disney, somebody bought didn't want the film released. Are we, are we not allowed to say the D word? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, uh, I mean, yeah. yeah. No, well, the, I mean, it doesn't matter. I don't know. Well, we're on, I mean, I, I don't know if you, uh, Disney. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, that's what it was. Disney bought the film and kept it on the shelf and wouldn't release it probably because they had, well, I don't know. I don't know why. Weird thing, right? That's odd. That's an odd yes. thing to do. I didn't understand the criticism of it. I didn't understand why people were like, well, well, this is just a right-wing propaganda film. We're talking about children. And yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you look at, uh, there was a Newsweek article, article that came out, I want to say 2015, talking about the rising problem of child trafficking in Colombia. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, uh, we were just talking about it you know, almost 10 years ago, what changed? It's not like we solved the problem. Nobody, nobody went down there. We didn't get a Rambo down there to, hey, all right, you guys are coming with me. We, we didn't fix it. So we wrote a story about it, like to hear it, here go. And everybody was like, la, 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 la. This is not really happening. <laughs> and I don't get it. Why would you want this to be quieted unless you have something to hide? But that, 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 right, that yeah. is none of my business. That's that's the implication. None of my business. Yeah. Just keep it that, safe. That's keep it safe, I just everybody. thought that was crazy. And then the the fact that uh, it uh, was able to be out in theaters for, you know. I, I was it, it though? Like a, but then I mean, they extend the run. I, well, they kind of had to because a lot of theaters were literally blocking it from being in, in their cities. A lot of cities, excuse me, were blocking it from being in their theaters. I tried to see it in Eugene. There was one theater playing it. We've got four theaters here. One of them was, 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 was playing it. It's, wow. uh, I mean, there was, there was definite pushback and that's what I don't understand. Who would push back against helping children? I don't know that. Yeah. That, that's wild. I heard some of the theaters were like, malfunctioning like the air conditioning would go out and all this right. other stuff and or and or you know or the the film would would uh would somehow cut off midway or um you, you know what's interesting actually i mean and i'm not i mean i'm not putting on my tinfoil hat but i saw it in the theater with a friend I mean, of mine I was gonna say by all means go ahead okay all right well i saw it in the theater in long beach uh with a friend of mine who took me to see it because it was so powerful she wanted me to see it in the theater and we kept noticing, and this was really strange. There was an usher that kept coming into the theater every 15 minutes with their flashlight. And every 15 minutes, they would walk across the front of the theater, holding the flashlight in the eyes of everybody sitting in the theater. When has that ever 
happened in a movie you've ever been to. I've been going to movies since they re-released Song of the South in 1983. You can't see that anymore because it's racist. And that's how old I am. And I never, I could, I've been going to movies my whole life and I've never, ever seen that behavior from an usher in my life. Just in that one. Odd. That Odd. is wild. I mean, they, uh, why? Why? They got to protect the, uh, I'm not going to say it. Uh, here, I'll put it up there. They got to protect yeah. the blanks, not the children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, now, oh, oh no, you got to be inclusive. Jake Curtis Strickland. I don't know if you realize this. It's 2024. They're maps now. Maps. Yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah. There, there's no way I would ever normalize that sort of language. One, one uh, you know, second. the fact that it has to be normalized proves that it's not normal. Right. Yeah. It's like when you, when you make so much, uh, cause so much of a stink over, over something like that, that, you know, has been, uh, since time immemorial, like that's a, a kind of a disgusting term and we shouldn't try to, it's like Carlin says, you know, when it's like, okay, you've got shell shock. And then he talks about, oh, well then they uh, downgraded it to uh, uh-huh. battle fatigue. And then, mm-hmm. it, you know, they, they just kind of keep making it uh, so that it doesn't sound as bad. You know? <laughs> well, that's, that's what I've said for years, man. It, it started with tolerance tolerance begat acceptance acceptance begat celebration and now we're in the age of endorsement we no longer can just celebrate it quietly you have to literally endorse it otherwise you will be called out silence is now violence my friend so even being having you know being switzerland and being like hey listen we want to stay neutral (laughs) you can't do that anymore you need to take a side or (laughs) they're gonna milkshake you in the street man so right it's uh, yeah. it's a sad, li- but this is getting off the. Ra- is this what we came to talk about? I thought we were talking about comedy. Good, this ain't yeah, funny. <laughs> no, I mean like it's it's. Uh, I just think it's interesting because, like I said, there now there's some sort of cultural pushback against a lot of the, you know, kind of the the trash that's out there that's in Hollywood, you know. And I I think it's I think it's I, good I like that. Yeah, I, I have confidence that. in the youth. I think that. Uh, you know, people complain about, oh, these kids these days, kids these days, oh, these kids. No, 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 no. Kids have always been kids. Kids are the same. It's the parents. The parents have changed. And I think what we're seeing is, yeah, you know, the pendulum always swings back. And I think we're starting to see it come back here finally with this newer generation where hopefully if they don't get too indoctrinated, they'll at least take a look around and go, wait a minute. Some of these things aren't right. You know, at least maybe with their country where they could look around and go, well, how come, you know, 60% of our paper money has been printed out within the last four years? How come my dollar value is about a nickel versus when my grandparents were, you know, out there buying houses for $23,000? And now, uh, the av- you know, I'm trying to buy a house right now. And I'm looking at the average income of Americans. I don't know if you know this. It's about $53,000 a year average income. And I'm not stroking my, my wiener here on your show, but I make much more than that. And I've saved up a good little nut so I can put some down. But the average home cost in America is over $490,000. That's almost half a million dollars. And yep. they want a certain percentage down. And they'll they'll give you that 30-year mortgage. But the, this is the crazy thing. The banks will tell you, yeah, you can get that $2,500 a month two-bedroom apartment. But we're not going to give you a mortgage on a $250,000 home at $900 a month. What? There's no logic behind that. And so we've really screwed ourselves. At least our parents' generation has screwed us up to the point where we don't have the same uh, abilities because uh, while housing prices have risen uh, and skyrocketed exponentially, uh, income has steadily increased, but certainly not at the level to keep up with the housing market. So it's 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 damn near impossible for somebody my age, at least in my line of work, unless I'm going to be a Dave Chappelle, to go out and purchase a home. You know what I mean? And so uh, I'm right. trying real hard and I'm working real hard. And that's why I'm putting all these shows in and doing these cruise work. Cause it's path of least resistance and it's a paycheck and it's steady work. Uh, but that's the ultimate goal, man. And it's getting tougher and tougher in this country because we keep printing money. Like it's newspaper out here. Yeah, that's true. Um, so what's really unique about doing the cruise work? I mean, you, you, it's like a Monday to Friday type thing. And then you, 
you know, you pull into different ports and then you kind of get to go and hang out there. Like what's the routine and what's really kind of the, um, uh, I guess you could say probably the most interesting thing that you've had happen on, uh, one of the cruise shows. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, the jokes are free in this business. They're paying me to travel because that's the big pain in the butt. You know, uh, a lot of times these ships are going out of New York, Florida, Charlotte, South Carolina, you know, uh, and, and places on the East coast. And so I'm flying out there overnight to get there in the morning to board the ship. And then I get on, uh, they have me go through this vessel familiarization, you know, as if I'm going to be saving people if we hit a iceberg on the way to Bermuda. And, and then I check my schedule and I might have anywhere from, depending on the ship, I might have no shows to, on the, on the bigger ships, like the Mardi Gras, Jubilee, the XLs, as they call them, the ones with the roller coaster on the, on the roof. Um, those I'll, I'll come on. I might do five shows in one day, 30 minute shows. Um, and so depending on the size of the ship, you'll do anywhere from five to 10 shows on a contract and a contract can be, gosh, it could be two, three days up to maybe five, maybe six, depending on where you're going. Um, and, uh, if, travel can manage it. Sometimes they'll, they'll have me get on, say in Jacksonville, we'll go down to Nassau and then they'll take us over to Freeport. And since I've, maybe I've done my shows, they'll get me off at Freeport, fly me over to another ship, uh, maybe in, you know, Honduras, I'll get on there. I'll do the contract there. And that that's basically how it works. Uh, and so it, they give me offers based on my avail availability. My agent passes those down to me. I say yes or no, depending on what I want to do and when I want to do it. And uh, that's that's how that is. And, you know, my ratings are good. My my Carnival people love me. They give me good uh, good reports. And so I think Carnival likes me and uh, I, I, I'm happy with them. And then uh, crazy, the craziest things ever happened. I, I hate even sharing this because it makes it look bad, but it really wasn't the company. This was these kids, man. We were working this Italian ship out of New York and it was during, I want to say Christmas break or some kind of time when kids were out of school. And it must've been Christmas break because we were at winter time and we couldn't get to three of the five ports we were supposed to go to. This is an eight day crew, nine day cruise. And we're supposed to go to five different ports. So that's, that's a long time on the ship. You need those ports to break it up. And we couldn't get to three of them because of weather. Mm -hmm. So we're out there like Columbus, man, you know, just sailing away. And the people are talking mutiny. They're like, you know, when are we going to find land, Captain? You know, <laughs> well, it wasn't the adults that were upset about it. It was the damn kids who didn't even pay for the vacation. They were literally gathering together and forming roving gangs based on whatever boroughs they were from in New York. And they were fighting each other in the halls, out on the Lido deck. They're trying to throw each other over from 11 to 10 into the pool. I mean, it was wild, wild. A security guard got his nose broken for the trouble of trying to break it up a fight. They literally had to slam airtight water, excuse me, watertight doors to secure a couple of kids in while they got the Ziplocs around their, uh, their, their hands so they could get them down to the brig. I mean, it was, these kids were wild. I get off stage for my last show. And I was going up to have a cigar on the smoking deck and it's a beautiful tile floor. And I step out of the elevator elevator and there's wet floor signs. And I'm looking at, I'm like, somebody spilled some coffee or tea. Cause that was an odd color. It was blotches of blood, splotches of pools of blood. One kid took a box cutter to another kid. I mean, these kids were wild. And where were the parents? I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, what they were doing. These kids were, you know, 16, anywhere from like, literally, literally from like 13 to 18 years old, 19 years old, roving around, just beating the hell out of each other. Uh, it was, it was absolutely wild. It was absolutely wild. This, that is crazy. That, oh man. Um, <laughs> you know, what do you, yeah, no, a, a, a crazy Lord of the Flies like, type stuff. Oh, I wish I, at least there was some order with Lord of the Flies. <laughs> so these guys were, they're, they're just running around like bloods and crips and then everybody else is crip walking. So, uh, that's probably time, more clockwork orange ish than Lord of the Flies. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. These droogs were, were definitely <laughs> yeah, they're drinking milk and beating the hell out of each other. Um, <laughs> one time at a show, 
<laughs> this was embarrassing for me. Uh, I was working, it was that same ship actually. And the host, her name was Miss, uh, Miss Dara. She called herself Cousin Dara because she was family to everybody. And when she gets on stage, she goes, uh, All right, uh, are you ready for a show? And, you know, of course, you get the. Da, da, da. And I don't know if you've ever been to a show where the audience gets it right the first time, but generally, the audience never gets it right. And you have to say, Ah, oh, I think we could do better than that. Hey, are you guys ready for a comedy show? And everybody has to go louder and go, Rah! So she was not having it. She was not, these people were not giving it up and she's not starting this show until we get together and get some energy out there and start clapping. Finally, finally, she lets me take the stage because the audience has now shown their worth and value. Except for one lady in front who's got this pink sweater on like a hoodie. And I, I guess she was cold because I, I couldn't see her arms. They were tucked into her. She had them tucked into her sleeves. Like she pulled them into her sleeves, into her shirt. You know how they do that when you were a kid? Yeah. You remember? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, hey, wait a minute. We can't start this show. I didn't see you clapping. You better start clapping. And she looks at me and she goes, I don't have any arms. So insert foot A into <laughs> mouth B. You know, and of course, <laughs> but Ouch. Here's the thing. I, I rode with it, though. And I go, well, uh, you know, well, we'll do what you can, you know, just flap something. And it got her <laughs> laughing, got the audience laughing. Later on, in uh, just before I'm finishing the set, I do this little joke about the captain upset with me saying, you know, Alex Elkin, please report to the navigational bridge and bring all of your luggage, you know. And I go, oh, I got to carry that out. Hey, can you give me a hand? And I point to her and she laughs and everybody laughs and I get off stage and I'll tell you this. That lady came up to me and she was so grateful and thankful. And I'll tell you why. Her whole life, she's had no arms. She's never had arms her whole life. But, and everybody treats her like somebody with no arms, you know? But for that moment, when I treated her like a regular person, and yeah, I prodded and poked a little fun at her. I mean, I was an idiot, of course. I didn't realize I wouldn't have done that had I known but we rode that wave and I included her in society and she got to feel what it felt like to be a normal person where ha, you get to be the butt of the joke every now and again. And it was, and it was okay. She was so thankful yeah. for that experience that she actually, I mean, she came up to tell me not shake my hand, but she came up to tell me that, uh, that that's how she felt. And I, I feel like, you know, uh, if we're going to inc be inclusive, really inclusive, then we don't need to set our people with, uh, extra, you know, with extra <laughs> out, you know, bring them in. Yeah. But being part of society means we make fun of everybody. And sometimes that's what we need. We need to make fun of everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. And and you took a situation that could have been potentially way more awkward. And that that's a, I will say that's a masterful recovery right there. Cause like you really <laughs> kind of like something that could have been really tense and could have went the wrong way. You, you took sure. it. You just, you flipped it and like, you know, made it, made it awesome, you know? So it's just, that's, it's that's just reading that. a room. Yeah. It's just reading a room. You, you know, you understand who you're dealing with and uh, you know, as long as you can pull it back and, and draw it onto yourself and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm the idiot here. <laughs> then it's okay. You know, cause nobody's going to get mad at you for laughing at you. That's just an old trick could, of the trade. But yeah. If you could open for, I don't know, three of your favorite comedians of all time, who would it be? <laughs> uh if i could open for them gosh yeah um no, i'd love to work with ralphie again we had a nice couple we had we had a good time um i got open for ah oh, gosh i don't know uh you know i love brian regan he's my he's my absolute number one hero i'd love to open for him um i don't know yeah I, uh well, I meant like they could be alive or dead. They could be like or Bill dead. Hicks, you know? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I definitely wouldn't want to follow Bill Hicks. There'd be nobody in the room. Uh, <laughs> he was he was known for walking people. You know, it's funny. As a comedian, you know, look at Hicks and Carlin, and I can appreciate them for their comedy, and I can understand why people thought they were funny. I never found them funny. I never laughed at Carlin, his stand-up anyway, and went, ha, 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 yes, you know? Uh but I did agree with him. I, you know, I, what, what I thought was he was more of like a, a humorist philosopher, you know, a comedic yeah. thinker. And, and I sat there and I'd be like, absolutely. 
That's that's just what I, I didn't know how to put it into words. And that's what I was thinking. It was never, oh, my God. Ah, ah, ah. But I can understand people that do feel that way. And Hicks was the same way. You know, he was just one of these guys who was like, oh, I never thought about it like that. Oh, yeah. You know, but I never really sat there and went, oh, man, this is killing me. My, you know, my guts hurt from laughing. Uh, Brian Regan does that. Um, uh, you know, Smothers Brothers did that, you know. Uh, uh, but. Uh, Gosh, yeah, Pryor. I'd probably, I'd like, to, I'd, I would have loved to work with Pryor, maybe. Yeah, but you know, the weird thing is, is when you've been in, you've been in the business as long, and I've met a lot of famous comedians. I met a lot of famous people. <laughs> the less of them, at least for me, the less of them you want to meet, because nine times out of ten they just let you down because they're just regular people and they're probably having sure, some yeah. crap day and they didn't have the oat milk or at Starbucks this morning, or, you know, somebody pulled their dryer out of the socks out of the dryer too early and they're damp and, you know, they're just something happened. They got a hangnail they're dealing with and it sucks. And, and you, you catch them on that day. And then that's your opinion. Of, oh, oh, you know, oh God, I can't believe Jack Black is the horrible person. He wouldn't, he wouldn't sign my buttock. You know, it's like, well, you know, he was taking a whiz at the moment, you know, or whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, look at Johnny Jello showing up. Where Johnny is Jello. Um, the comedian out of Arizona. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those uh, old aphorisms, you know, don't meet your heroes type things. But, you know, that you could actually meet true. them and then your your perception of them or, you know, the. the have you ever experienced, I'm sure you have, like, you know, where somebody will tell you, oh, that person's an awful person. They, you know, their reputation kind of precedes them a little bit, but then you meet them and they're like, oh, you're, they're really not that bad, you know, like. Yeah. Have you ever experienced sure. that? Yeah. Oh, of course. All the time. You know, uh, you just you just can't believe what you hear about other people from other people. You know, you, you have to experience them yourself. Uh you know, I mean, I, I mean, other than maybe Hitler, I think uh, I think most <laughs> yeah, people should I think get the we can all agree on that one. Definitely. <laughs> most people should get the benefit of the, of the doubt, you know, I guess, and yeah. uh, try them out, see if they suck. Uh, yeah, I, I've never. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, like, I don't want to sit here and talk crap on the comics that I hate, but there's a bunch of them. <laughs> and it's because I've met them, you know, and I know them. There's a couple uh, I like. Let's see. All right. Uh, Johnny says, got to rem remember that your hero is another person, too. We're all flawed in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Johnny. Yeah. Listen, when your interview comes up, you can bring up all the little witticisms you want to. But this is my time now. OK, so night night. Night night, Johnny Jello. Night night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joe Bando's here. What a great guest. So animated. what up, Bando? <laughs> Bando. <laughs> Bando's that guy, he's making some waves. He's... Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm seeing. Oh, Bando's uh, got a podcast. I haven't gotten the. In, I haven't gotten the invite. Oh, I think he's uh, not really focusing LMAO on it uh, that heavily, but uh, should be a good thing once he gets it going. Um, now, like as far as like comedy goals, like what do you what do you see yourself doing like in the next five years or so, aside from the the cruise ship circuit uh aside from the yeah uh cruise ship is just a means to an end uh it's it's a it's steady work like i said in the paycheck right now and it's putting money in the little coffers so i can get that house that's so freaking unattainable and uh, in 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 uh in the long run you know what i really like to do is i'd like to really grow my voice acting portfolio i'd like to jump into more uh mainstream work and bigger work and uh you know maybe something where i can get some residuals uh I would like to uh, take what I've learned from my stage show that I produced with another comedian called Stand Up for America, Comedy for Patriots, which got me into all that trouble with the left. Uh, I'd like to take what I've learned with that and do another theater show and really promote it and sell out some theaters and and because uh, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy doing that. And I like to bring in different aspects of my talent. I like to do... The voices and music and animation and and comedy and poetry and whatever else i can throw out there so that it's a it's a, a well-rounded show people feel like they're paid to see something and uh so i'd like to see that happening I, I know the cruise ship thing won't won't be uh 
won't be forever. I don't know how much longer it's really going to be, actually, because it's a corporate gig. And my mouth gets me in trouble all the time. Any day now, I'm just waiting for that phone call where like, oh, somebody complained and uh, they're not going to use you anymore. So once that happens, it doesn't scare me. You know, I can go back to doing one nighters and bar gigs and I've gained enough of a following now, I think, where I can put myself in just about any city and I've got enough backing behind me to where I can promote it enough to fill the seats and go anywhere I want. And that's the great thing about this business. So uh, I'm not locked in anywhere, but as far as goals, um, I'm achieving what I've always wanted, man. I'm, I'm doing what I love. My wife doesn't have to work. My kids are happy and healthy and clothed and I get to take them with me once in a while when I do the gigs and uh and all the bills are paid i mean it's uh, what more do you really want it's, awesome. it's beautiful yeah really I wish it I wasn't mean, raining like, uh, you know but other than that i, I i'm kind of with you in in the boat of uh you know like being famous terrorizes you know scares me as well you know i i think i'd just rather like be able to do what i like on a you know at least a somewhat of a, a level to where you get some sort of income and then that's just enough you know and like don't yeah. have to be like, uh, you know, a superstar or anything like that, just so I can, you know, yeah, keep the lights on, you know, do all that, pay the bills. Right. What more could you ask? And, you know, really? and with with music, uh, at least I find with music, it's a little different because, you know, comics, I don't know what happened to us, man. We got dropped on our heads. We didn't get hugged by our mommies enough, but we <laughs> we crave and demand that attention. You know what I mean? Uh, that's, that's what draws us to this. We We're literally seeking the approval of total strangers through laughter with our thoughts music boy you could do that in a room by yourself and please nobody but you and it's okay if i do comedy by myself it sucks that's just a circle jerk and nobody wants to do that um so that's what kind of separates it so music you can be in a studio with your buddies and you know it, it's smoky and it's gritty and it's raw and it stinks and you put out some of the greatest sounds you've ever put out there and whether or not you get that recognition from anybody else it doesn't really matter because you you know you've created it and it's there it helps you want that recognition because it comes with the money and all that but with comedy if you don't get that recognition there's nothing there it's empty it's pointless it's drab it's you know it's blah if i tell a joke and nobody laughs that's not comedy that's a Hannah Gadsby special. Oh, anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> this, this would not be the first time her name came up on this show. Oh, it's a, that's a girl. Anyway. Um, Oh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I'm being controversial. Oh no. <laughs> but, um, you, you want that as a comic. And, uh, so there's a little bit of it that I crave. I like that recognition. I like to hear, you know, good job. I want the laughter, of course. But speaking of the ships, that little bit of celebrity, that taste of celebrity that I get on the ship where I've introduced myself to about 4,000 people and we can't help but run into each other when we're going to the buffet or, you know, sure. walking around outside. And I get those, hey, great job. Or, hey, can I get a picture with you? Or, hey, can I, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. That I don't mind because it's for a limited time and I can go away from it anytime I want to. I couldn't imagine that in the real world. That would be a scary thing. You go into a restaurant yeah. and somebody comes up and they want to talk to you and you got your kid in your hand, you know, or, or you're at the grocery store or, you know, anywhere. And the perfect stranger knows you. And the thing about comedy, man, you're revealing intimate details about yourself on stage to 200, 300, 400, sometimes thousands of people at one time. And the thing is, is they develop a connection with you because you're now revealing these intimate details of your life that they're connecting with. And so they've created this bond, this friendship. But the difference is, is I haven't created that with you. You're just my audience. I'm one person that you've created that with me. So now when I get off stage, you feel like you know me. So you can talk to me in a certain way and you can, you know, or you feel that anyway. And it's strange for me. And I couldn't imagine being a real celebrity and having that feeling where it's like, oh, I saw this guy's movie, so he owes me a uh, a, a relationship. You know, I he doesn't realize how close I am to who, this character he played or this thing that he said. So he, he, if he only knew, then he would know how close we should be. And they develop that in their heads. And they, I'll give you an example real quick. I don't know how much time we have, but it was Christmas time, and I was buying a rib roast at the local Albertsons, and the guy recognized my voice from the radio show I used to do. And he goes, hey, man, are you doing any stand-up comedy locally? And I was like, yeah, here's my business card, which had my website and my phone number on it. And I said, 
check out my calendar and maybe you want to do a local show, let me know and I'll make sure you guys get a couple of tickets. Oh, that'd be awesome. 1 a.m. that same night, I'm woken up to a text message from this guy. Hey, man, it's the butcher from Albertsons. I got to talk to you right now. And I'm like, bro, unless this is a recall on my rib roast, what could we possibly have to talk about at one in the morning? Well, it turns out he developed this kind of relationship with me because he listened to my um, my radio show where I'm I'm being intimate. I'm talking to you about my life. And so sure. he's relating to that. And he's become now somebody in my life that I don't even know, but he knows me and they create that out there. And boy, if that was out in the real world to, you know, the Brad Pitts or the Dave Chappelle's or the Dana Carvey's or whoever you want to name, that's got to be frightening. The little taste of it yeah. I get on the ship, that's enough. That's plenty. I don't want any more. And that's that's why I'm not chasing it, man. I'm not chasing the big fame. Now, let's see here. Alex bit about the one ply <laughs> toilet paper and then strangers getting their food at the buffet classic. Yeah. It's always hilarious when you, when you put it like that. Yeah, I, that's that's great. I'm known for my bathroom humor. <laughs> my my toilet joke, my toilet paper jokes A+. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. See yes. I uh, I love uh, that. One. Johnny Jello says I watched Cobra Kai 3 times. William Zapka owes me karate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Don't be funnier on me funnier than me on my interview, Johnny Jello. Get the hell out of here, you son. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, I, I mean, uh, what was that movie with um, uh, Robert De Niro and Wesley Snipes, The Fan, where he was like super obsessed with the baseball player? Did oh, you ever yeah, see that I one? See that. No, I didn't see it. Oh, was it a comedy? Crazy good. Yeah. Oh. The Fan. I, I got to, I'll check it out, but, you know, I'm hesitant and I'll tell you why. And people, I, you can, you can crucify me for this if you want to. I'll just say it. <clears throat> Robert De Niro has no business doing comedy. Robert De Niro is not funny. Robert De Niro is a great dramatic actor. He can do suspense. He can do crime. He can do drama. But that man is the farthest thing from funny I've ever seen. Ever. And whoever told him that he should do comedies should have their SAG card shredded up and shoved into their pee-pee hole. Uh, <laughs> oh man he's not funny he's not he's not funny he's not funny i don't know i heard I don't know. um i don't know who told me is it, you know i've never seen the king of comedy he's not good in that he's not funny no oh. <laughs> he's not funny he's never he's not funny it's just not uh, i don't know how else to put it anyway um let's see here david king says i loved your biden routine Oh, God. A lot of people ask me, hey, I bet you make fun of Joe Biden. I bet you got some good Biden jokes, but you stick it to old Sleepy Joe. And I'm like, no, I don't I don't really like to make fun of uh, Alzheimer's. That's not funny. But uh, I do Biden material. Who who does it? You got to make fun of the president. Look, I don't care how you feel about politics. They're politicians. They are there to be made fun of. You know, the crazy stuff that they do and, uh, well, the detrimental stuff that they do. It should be laughed at and at the very least talked about. And like I said, if you're going to tell people the truth, make sure they're laughing. Otherwise, they will kill you. That is very true. Um, what do you do, like, um, you know, when you're not performing comedy? Um, what do you, as far as, like, entertainment, what do you what do you really get into as far as, uh, you know, films are concerned? What are you reading? New, new uh, music, right now, new I'm in bands. the middle of. I love uh, I love autobiographies. Biographies. Right now, in the middle of Michael Caine's autobiography, uh, that's a fun one to read. I mean, it's a little outdated though, because he's talking about Sidney Poitier as if he's still alive. Um, but I love that kind of stuff. I love I love bios. I love autobios. Uh, I do like to read. Um, you know what I dig? I dig classic video games, like uh, you know, seventies, eighties, nineties, anywhere from Commodore sixty four on up to. Uh, oh, man, I, I had a C64. Sega Genesis. Yeah. Sega Genesis was probably like the latest system that I bought before I had kids, you know, and then it was the Wii and all that all that stuff. But uh, I bought myself this little retro pie that I've been taking on the road with me and I could plug it into the TV at, uh, at on, the, on the ships. And uh, yeah, I'll sit there and I'll play Super Mario Brothers or some old Sega Genesis games or Master System games that I used to love. And 
Um, just have an old, a good old time playing, you know, Frogger for God's sakes. I love that stuff. Uh, David King says your ad lib interaction with the audience is awesome. Thank you, David King. You know, I took inspiration from the uh, amazing, uh, just, well, legendary comedian, uh, Matt Reif, who, I don't know if you know this, is the inventor of crowd work and ad lib. Uh, so a lot of the inspiration was watching him and seeing what he does. Now, I'm, I'm just an amateur compared to, to him. He's been doing comedy at least four or five years. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, thank you. That's a, that's flattering. I, I do appreciate that. Gotti Jello says retro pie, baby. That's right. Of course, any pie really. Um, let's see here. Uh, any series you're watching anything, uh, good lately grace your television screen. Yeah. I, I like to get into shows. I was, you know what I really got into was Yellowstone. And then I got into 1883, which I really dug. And then I was getting into 1923, and I really liked that. But Yellowstone left me hanging here. I think it was like season five and a half. And uh, Kevin Costner's pissed about something. They were going to bring in McConaughey, and now they're not. And there's all this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, these shows now, uh, it started with like, for me, with like The Walking Dead. I got into it. I loved it. And then you're going to make me wait a year and a half to see the next season. Well, by then, I don't care anymore. You know, I've lost interest. I don't know the story. I don't want to rewatch it to follow it. I, I was in the moment then, not so much now. So a lot of these shows, they lose me uh, yeah. when I have to wait and wait and wait. So uh, yeah, I've been getting I, into I a lot I, of. I, di I dipped out of Walking Dead like mid middle of the sixth season. Just kind of yeah. lost me, you know. I don't. Yeah, I don't, and now they got uh, the the dog Walking Dead, and and uh, you know the uh, the fast walker the you know, jogging dead and all the, everything. I'm just making this up. I don't know, but they, they got so many dead shows. You know. Yeah. They do have quite a few. Um, let's see here. Corey Hughes is laughing. Um, Corey, good to see you, buddy. What, what do you do like to just kind of like, um, you know, unwind? Like, do you, uh, are, do you ever like get out in nature? Do you meditate? You do anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> Meta. That's funny. Uh, I do some drugs every now and again. Sure. Get out and hit some mushrooms <laughs> once a summer. Uh, we have a, we have a sea dew that we like to get out on the, on the lake uh, in the summertime. We, um, uh, you know, like uh, really I could sit at the piano or the guitar for hours and hours and hours and just, just pluck around and play tunes and jam with the kids. And, you know, I just love that kind of stuff. Uh, so when I'm, when I'm not busy, you know, being home is the vacation. A lot of people are like, oh, it must be great going to all these exotic places. And I'm not complaining. I love the sunshine. But being home is the vacation. So when I'm home, uh, it's, man, I just like to, to chill out. I like to play music. I like to smoke meats. Uh, I'm a big, a big smoker of meats. I do a lot of brisket and bacon and, uh, uh, you know, chicken and all that good stuff and cheeses. Uh, I like to cook. And... Um, yeah. Other than that, just try to try to keep it simple. On right on. All right, let's see here. Um go back. I missed this comment here earlier. Johnny Jello said the bills are paid, the pizza is fresh. Baba go. <laughs> hey, Baba go. Uh we went to we went to this pizza place together. It was, uh, we, we worked a weekend in, um, in Gilbert, Arizona. And, uh, we went to this pizza place and it was just phenomenal. Great food. Can't remember the Best name. Best place of it. to ever play. Like what's favorite area of the country or even, you know, one of the cruise stops, man, <laughs> uh, wherever the check clears, really. I, I love my Texas folks. I love my Galveston people, you know, so I like to work cruises out of there. Um, but you know, you know what I really enjoy? Uh, Southern Oregon, honestly, Medford, Grants Pass, Rogue River area. Those people, man, uh, they're just my folks. I've recorded several, uh, actually a couple of different albums uh, down there just because I like them. Uh, they always show up. They always represent. They're good folks. But um, 
anybody that digs my comedy, man, those, those are my people. Uh, because at this point, uh, I do it, I do it because I love it, but I love it because I love them. I love the response. I love, I love seeing them coming out to the shows and going, Hey, we saw you here. And, uh, you know, or we watched you on YouTube and we came out anyway. And, you know, I, I love that kind of response. I love to know people are digging it. Brooklyn V's. That's right. Brooklyn that was the V's. place. Yeah. Oh, let's see here. Now Peter will be after you. <laughs> Gotta get off this. All right. We'll finish this. Finish this up. And we'll go. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, all right. Um, you know, any upcoming, uh, up and coming comics in your area that you feel like deserve recognition, people that are really kind of making their way up. Nope. Nope, hate them all. Every single one of them, backstabbing bastards. Single Every one. single one of them. Right? Joe Bando would, too. <laughs> oh, oh, you, I, you, oh, you said my area. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it doesn't uh, have to be region specific, I suppose. But I mean, okay, you know, just okay, to... yeah. No, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, got to check out Joe Bando. Uh, um, I love. Uh, um, Oh, well, I mean, not that he needs my help, but Shane Gillis is killing it. I love, I love how truthful Shane he is. Shane Gillis, man, like I, I just recently, because you know, I heard about his whole controversy back in the day being fired from Saturday Night Live, and then now he's hosting Saturday Night Live. You know, like that's got to be like, it's like poetic justice, you know. Oh, well, it's got to feel good. Yeah, you know, yeah. Nor when Norm Macdonald did it, he, I think he said it best. You know, either either the show really sucks or uh, uh i'm funny again because <laughs> you know they fired him for not being funny that's what they that's said right anyway, that's but right but his his delivery was always great it was always so like you know deadpan and like you know you didn't know if you should laugh or or not and you, yeah point, you he's already got you you know yeah he didn't yeah. know he was brilliant he was just brilliant i loved him uh, uh let's see here uh dead comic tv show executive producer alex Hawkins. yeah i'm dead naming that's all <laughs> well cool man um well uh anything you want to promote uh here coming up real quick before uh we uh end the show here absolutely yeah so uh there's a film out right now you can look it up it's called advanced chemistry uh, just like you you didn't take in high school, Advanced Chemistry. It's starring Shantae Wayans and Samba Shoot. And I got a small part in there. And they liked me so much on set that they, uh, I actually got to write my own lines. And I got a, I got a line in the movie. Uh, so that nice. was kind of cool. Made me SAG eligible. Uh, so look for that. Look for Advanced Chemistry with Shantae Wayans. It's kind of funny. Um, totally outside of the realm of anything that I would produce or do. But, you know, I said yes because it was a paycheck. Uh, so check that out. I've got... Um, you know, we talked about dry bar, which is clean comedy. Uh, there's a lot of dry great bar dry bar times. Yeah. yeah. A lot of great dry bar comedy specials out there. Definitely. I don't have one. They don't like me. So, uh, I'm doing what's called an open bar comedy special where they're letting me be me. And I've got an open bar comedy special coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, so keep an eye out, uh, to open bar, give them a follow on TikTok and, and anywhere else you stream your comedy, open bar comedy, very funny guys. And it's the people that you don't see. Uh, it's like we were talking about the ones that are grinding out there on the road every day. Really funny stuff. So check out my open yeah. bar special coming up. Uh, you can go to my website, alexelkin.com. And I got my comedy calendar there. So you can look at all my dates on cruises. If you're thinking about taking a cruise and you want to go somewhere fun with me, please feel free to take a look at the ships that I'm on and, and come jump on with me. Uh, other than that, I got land gigs all over the country. Literally, I'm going to be everywhere. So uh, check me out in Florida and Arizona, California, uh, and all kinds of great stuff. May the 4th, if you are in LA, uh, I'm going to be raising money doing comedy with uh, the um, the creator of the Babylon Bee and a couple of other really funny characters, Adam Yenser, who was on Ellen. He was a, a Emmy, Emmy winning uh, comedy writer. And then myself. And we're going to be raising money for uh, a guy who was unjustly arrested for being at the J6. So uh, we're going to go out there and raise a little money for him, take care of his legal fees, hopefully. So if you can come out and support that, go to malacomedy.com. That's make America laugh again, comedy.com, M-A-L-A comedy.com. Anyway, that's what's coming up with me. I'm all over the place. And uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to help my 19 year old hopefully go buy a new truck for him. So that's, uh, that's what's on my agenda. Oh, awesome. Awesome, man. 
Well, cool. I'll be sure to post all the links for um, all of that down here in the comment section. I'll pin them up at the top. And um, dude, thank you so much for uh, for your time. And I really appreciate uh, being able to hear about all your endeavors, man. I'm going to probably have some questions for you later. But um, let's see here. Uh, okay, so as you can see on the banner there, uh, I run a merchandising company. It's called Hell's Heart Merch Co. Hellsheartco.bigcartel.com. If you use the code 20, uh, you get 20% off your entire purchase of my my shirts. And I do little things here and there. And um, so let me uh, throw up some samples here real quick. If you like, uh, like it, support here's it. The, <laughs> here's the Hell's Heart black flag. Here's a bullet. Uh, here's a Psycho 2. Here's a Scream glow in the dark. I'm sure she's a nice lady. Scream. <laughs> uh all right uh so yeah go on over there support uh like comment share subscribe click on the bell for notifications that would be greatly appreciated and uh, like i said i'll be posting in the links in the uh comment section so uh just go on over and support alex elkin at all of his digital platforms all right everybody i want to thank you all so much namaste job bless be good alex elkin thanks bro thanks everybody